Radia. Assalamu alaikum, good evening, uh, dear colleagues and friends. Welcome to one of the meeting uh, new uh, retina hub uh, that is done physically. And uh, today is sponsored by uh, Novartis. We'd like to thank Novartis for sponsoring this uh, meeting. Uh, and we'll start with the first presentation by dear Dr. Hassan Hassan. Uh, it will be about Tulsidima in DME, and he's an ophthalmology consultant, retina team leader in Dubai. Hospital, Dr. Hassan, thank you. Assalamu alaikum, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to uh, reserve the rest of the day to Allah. Uh, the first presentation for me will be Today. today, I will speak about Rosumab uh, in Dialectic Medical Radio. Thank uh, for uh, Novartis Cross Council this uh, presentation. Uh, as you know, that this review uh, got the approval from June 2022 for the DUM using. Diabetic macular edema. Uh, as we discussed, diabetic macular edema, the presence of the uh, intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid, it will be affect the vision in DME or no. According to the pathology of the diabetic macular edema, uh, disruption of the retinal inherent in the barrier, it will cause leakage of this intraretinal fluid or subretinal fluid, and affect the retinal sensitivity, which mostly will affect uh, the vision of the uh, patients. So, if we go for the just for the to see that this is a retinal fluid or subretinal fluid according to the uh, post hoc uh, analysis for the uh, protocol uh, protocol uh, team, you can find that, that the patient in the, in the baseline, the patient mostly they have if they have a retinal fluid or subretinal fluid, mostly they will have uh, worse visual visual acuity. And again, if you go for the protocol eye, again, even the patients who has uh, uh, consistent uh, or persistent macular edema, uh, it will be even continue for a long time, even until the third year, around 40% of these patients, they have persistent macular edema. This will to affect the result of the patients. Even if we go back to the protocol T or the post, uh, post analysis that these patients will see the fellow percept even that uh, monthly injection with even uh, risk of treatment by the laser, still around one third of the patient or one fourth of these patients, still they have persistent macular edema. And through, through protocol I, that we found that even the patient who has, has the relation between the proportional relation between the, uh, the, the, the amount of macular edema and the uh, number of the uh, vision will begin uh, reverse uh, proportional uh, relations. That with the patient who has more macular edema, he will have less uh, gaining in the visual acuity than it. For the rule of the way of view and improve the visual or anatomical outcome for, uh, for diabetic macular edema, 
especially with fewer number of injections from the beginning of the treatment. So understanding the pharmacological part of the medication, this is compared to a valuable medication. You can see the Golizumab is the, the smallest uh, molecular part uh, uh, here, and it's around around 25 kilodalton. This is mean that you have, have higher uh, penetration uh, feature, and again, it will have even more more uh, number of uh, molecular and the uh, dosage compared with by the other medication. This is going to be give maybe kind of uh, durability for the medication. For the for the kite and uh, kistrel, which uh, uh, compare between the view view and the field percept. This is the um, uh, multi sites uh, study. The, uh, the difference between cast and kestrel, the kite, the kite there is just compared between uh, six milli, six milligram view uh, view and uh, flow percept two milligram. And the idea was here in the kite and the week seventy, they will extend, they give the extend to go for more than uh, twelve weeks to go for sixteen weeks. Kestrel will go. Compared between two dosage for the view view, three milligram and six milligram and two percent. The primary objective uh, to be the nine of between the view view and the flip percept from the beginning, from the baseline uh, visual acuity uh, until the uh, week 52. And secondary end ones, it was a proportion of the patient who kept on the 12 weeks uh, in terms of injections. And uh, uh, second, the proportion of the patient who, from the preview compared between the two medication, and the return to the uh, OCT findings uh, for from anti uh, outcome. And uh, the percentage of the patient who kept on the Q12 Q uh, intervals of injections. The inclusion and exclusion criteria, the most important thing that all the patients was naive patients, no patient with the BDR in this uh, study. And most of the balance between the demographic and even retinal uh, finding between uh, the two studies. And you can see even here in the retinal period and subretinal period around the same. Uh, from the loading cost of the maintenance, as you know that the BOV given every six weeks in the average market that we then they extended for two weeks, uh, eight weeks, or 12 weeks, depending on the primary uh, evaluation uh, time. It will be in the first disease activity, it was decided for the medication to be in the 32 weeks. Uh, and when you compare between two medications already, the percent they used in the regular hour, or label, label medication was using every four, every, uh, four weeks for five loading dose, then every eight weeks. Uh, depending on the approval for the medication. And uh, on this spot of evaluation, you know that the patients and the flippercept uh, are already received one, one more injection than the BVV. Again, here, the value after the evaluation of 32 weeks, it will be decided for the patient to go for the Q12 or Q8 uh, uh, treatment. Um, that this activity it was masked uh, investigators and uh, stability again it will be here for the kite uh, as we explained for the kite while well, in the third 70 weeks they will decide it can extend it for more for uh, 16 weeks and we compare the two medications we can find that the the base the, the, the difference between the the, the, the two the two medication was uh, the, the, the give the, the, the efficacy of the view view to be the same as an or non inferior to the flipper sub with less number of injection in the, in the first year. Again, around in uh, and died around uh, half the patient in the, in the first year was in the Q12 uh, in the uh, in treatment. And uh, this is the valuation for the first year around, around it's considered from 36 weeks until 52 weeks, around 90 percent uh, of the patient was in the uh, in the Q12. Yeah, just this is the secondary endpoint. 
to look after the intraretinal fluid or subretinal fluid compared between the two medications. You can, say, you can find that the severity of the PV to be better than the clear percept and the, and the dryness in subretinal or intraretinal fluid, in spite of this endpoint wasn't uh, studied uh, statically uh, uh, for, 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 for this purpose. But, but according to the numbers, it was severity. It's another one here. This is even after the uh, they look at after the 52 weeks at the end of the one first year, and here again they look at the other uh, the uh, marker of the anatomical outcome was the OCT. Again, here is the OCT on the if you uh, are was better than the uh, the flippership. Again, uh, secondary endpoint wasn't uh, statically studied. Uh, study. Uh, about the safety, when we speak about the prismatherapy, this is the most important thing for us about the safety of the prisma because depending on the how can tell you that there was cases of the around 33 percent, three percent of cases they have uh, interrupted inflammation or even they have um, uh, occlusive uh, vasculitis. So if you go for the the overall safety, it was around uh, comparable between the medication and the kind of vessel. And if you go for the most important intraocular inflammation, it was just in the kistral. Uh, there was in the one patient with six uh, mg was as retinal uh, vasculitis with occlusive retinal uh, uh, occlusive uh, issue. And uh, on the other side, the kite, uh, they both uh, the BV and the percept they have occlusive uh, retinal uh, accident, but wasn't wasn't uh, accompanied by interrupted inflammation. So if we from this that we will compare that there's a there's there's maybe kind of difference between the even the, the interrupted inflammation when we compare it by the AMD patients. It could be related for the disease, it could be related for the patient here in the diabetic macular the diabetic patient mostly they have I mean, formal and formal. Or sometimes they say that it will be affect the inflammatory reaction uh, in this patient to be lower than the others. For any reason, the and the kind of cancer was the intraocular inflammation was uh, around the same in kind of, uh, the cancer. The incidence was one percent. And just I want to share maybe after the approval, we 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 try this indication. We we, we tried in the CMD and before. But for us, we will diabetes, we recruit patients. Uh, this one patient, maybe in this case, was a patient who has a uh, history of antibiotic received, was previous one that didn't shift it for steroid. Then the patient received uh, bilateral uh, lumen in May 2022. But the patient present has good response. You can see here, we follow up the patient after four months, you can start retinal fluid. There is drain here, the retinal fluid. But the patient hasn't any improvement in the OCT or in the vision. And then it was, the vision was 0.3 and 0.5 in the left eye. There is subretinal fluid in all, uh, in spite of the destroyed genetic, this retinal fluid will be absorbed directly. So we decided to top up by the BUV for this patient. And you can see there's huge difference in the left eye OCT. In spite of this, is very chronic. You can see the extra dates. And the patient has results of retinal fluid and the vision grew for 0.7. And for us, the right eye improved one, one, one line. So, resolving of the subretinal fluid, improving the OCT and the vision. So, we decided to continue with the uh, loading dose for the PUV. Another, just I want to share another case from us that about the efficacy of the PUV or the subretinal fluid. This case of corboidal uh, PCB, uh, the patient has uh, came to us to, for the treatment and we advised him. Uh, to go for the PV. So from the second injection of PV, we can see the patient receive the vision will become one and the uh, anatomical was very good response and you can see here even this is maybe the last positive for the patient was was stable and was the patient was in the Q, Q8 in the beginning we went to the Q12 but he has recurrence so we we change it for the Q8 until the, that maybe after time we will extend them more for the 12 Q12. So Again, if we go for the kite and the strip, uh, you can say even in the, uh, the second year, you can see still that surely there is a huge difference between number of injection between the BUVU and the uh, flippercept because flippercept was using the fixed uh, treatment every uh, eight weeks. 
and again for the patient who who has around around 45 years of the patients and uh, both the, these studies was on the Q12 uh, interval projections and about the safety even the safety of, uh, for the patient extended for the two years is the same as the first year so as we speak uh, the rule of the new view and the attack and the demon, it's comparable to the flavorcept and this number of injection was extended uh, between the between the internal the interval of the injection until three months or even four months, sixteen weeks. And uh, here is the loading process every six weeks and uh, the patient can after that uh, go for the Q the Q8 or Q12 depending on the primary uh, Value assistant assistance to be in the 32 weeks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Hassan, for this uh, very nice presentation. Uh, is there any question from any of our panel or, or any speaker here or any attendees? Anyone want to comment? Dr. Hazan, the only limitation seems to be in both gastric and kite studies, the populations that have been taken are North American and South American. The only Asians taken are Japanese. Yeah, the, the, they say that there's more Hispanic, Hispanic races in the American one. But uh, this is the, the demographic. This is, they mentioned that the Hispanic, the Hispanic race was more in the Caribbean case. But it was... I would actually emphasize the absence of the Asians, you know, the true Asians, the mainland Asians. Not being included in the study, you know, which are going to be our treatment population. I think we are waiting now the over I mean, the real world uh, data from this medication. We will not depend on even the, if you go for the kit, kit and kestrel. For us, this is not the real life. The real life is to get the medication and the real life that to extend the flipperset even if you want it. This is just for the approval of the, the medication, so you can find that. Uh, some difference because the recruitment was strict. They need patients without any, uh, any history of anti VGF. They need patients without any uh, So, recruitment sometimes strict the study, I think. Yeah, I have a question. Dr. Hassan, I just wanted to ask you for a treatment live patient. What is the protocol you follow for your. In our hospital? In your hospital? Yeah, we are a governmental hospital. So, uh, when you yes, 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 yes. Uh, if you ask me, now we live in a time where we have this kind of medication. Before I remember that, when you reach the Avast, it was a huge, huge achievement for us when we were in my practice in my primary hospital in Syria. So, the Avast was a dream for us. Now, uh, now with this number of the injection which we have, it, if you ask me, I prefer to give the chance for the medication. Even in that, if you see that uh, Q, uh, Q6 is very important. When you deal with this, this is very important. And I think it will not, the battle between the medication will not be stopping. You will see another another uh, extended for the loading dose. So if you ask me, if I have one patient and the hospital generally, if you have to enter a new medication, you need an approval. So depending if I was free in the clinic, surely I will, I will request the new medication because we have the Paris lab and we have the view of you, but this is, we say that our hospital is not stock. This means you can't prescribe, you need an approval for that. Approval doesn't mean you need one more. Depending on the situation, if the patient is uh, uh, CMDM, we will not wait. But if the patient is diabetic, sometimes we are blind. You can see, we, we, we use it, I think we are, maybe the time was strict for me, the, until bring the cases, so uh, uh, we have we used the BU until now. We don't have any cases. We are we try to uh, to choose the cases, but for us, I prefer that to see this uh, indication in the real life. Uh, this is the study. We see it. there is difference. If you ask me, uh, I saw clear evidence that BU is good in the patient with uh, uh, polyboidal polymeth. So in the chronic market, in the chronic market, you know, as in this patient, there is rule. Maybe the others, maybe we can see that shifting between the BBG and sometimes we're not expected because this molecular is very small. This is theory. We don't know. In the real life, we will know that this is clear. 
So what we talk about some tiny little bit for this next uh, presentation. For the real life, we have uh, a guest uh, one or two months ago from India, and he did uh, also a uh, study on real life patients. And uh, he doesn't, uh, he didn't have any, 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 any reaction of uh, this side of things. We know the uh, vasculitis or the intracranial inflammation, but he used this uh, medication as PRN. He, 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 yeah, he, 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 he did it uh, follow this uh, three loading dose, and uh, and also he found uh, he found that in the cases of polyprotein, uh, uh, he. Uh, this medication did, did, did very well, and surprisingly, he didn't have any, 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 any even, even he has a case of, of uh, more, uh, more than one hundred cases. I will, I will share one case with you. Yeah, I wanted to put it in the lecture just to to give the at least to give the idea that something that we have a patient with polyvagal problem, and we explain to our colleagues we try for everything, everything. So in the end, we think that we give them even charisma. But the patient single out. When we speak with her, she's already five us here and here about view view. We wanted as a team to give her view view because we saw this case. But the patient said in the last uh, treatment by the other medication, she is, she developed interrupted inflammation. So here we can't use the view. So we said she ran from the interrupted inflammation, then she got it from another medication. So for me now, if you ask me if the patient came for me as we have polyvoidal uh, polyvoidal I will advise him for the directly review. If you ask me about the patient to receive steroid injection, I will advise him directly for review. I will not choose another medication because this medication is already tested. About naive patients, I think that uh, the patient who didn't like to go for the monthly loading dose, you can try it for him. As we say, the anthropic inflammation according to right. And Kistrin is not as in the A and D cases. So maybe related for the diabetic, uh, as we said, diabetic mellitus uh, pathology. So if, we, if you, I think that now we just approval of only this medication, any medication to we practice it will be new. Need time until you you have. It. This is when you try it with the flimbacil before exemitazole, then you know you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for uh, nice comments and guidance. I think what uh, Sandeep, uh, Dr. Sandeep uh, meant, are you feeling comfortable to start with, with a view in naive DME? I mean, to start treating uh, DME. Of course, in uh, polypoidal, as you mentioned, uh, you feel comfortable to start right away with the medication. But for diabetic macular edema cases, do you feel comfortable starting with this, especially because some, some for me, for example, sometimes I, I give aflipercept every, not every four weeks, uh, the loading dose, maybe every five weeks, six weeks, and it works fine. So uh, I'm not sure I don't have the, the experience to say in DMP, but uh, I think this is what uh, Dr. Sandy gave me to. Yeah, again, we go back, we have new medication. And if you ask me if the patient came with me with separate and extensive macular edema and he's naive and I would take him for the NKBG, mostly I would choose the view. For me, I, I feel that the time to, to try this medication to see this is this medication is better than the percept or no. The percept is better. So according for us, still even this if you go for this study, it's for the approval, not the real life. Even the percept is treat and extend and they have they reach. The Q12, Q2, 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 Q14. But if you ask me, before we was shaking from using the view view in the AMD. But when we tried in one patient, this patient, he reached one, still one. Generally, you will not find the polyboiler to see this patient. For us, it was magic. So it could be that the, the practice of this, of this medication give the chance to use it. Uh, any other uh, comments or questions? So, uh, so basically, I have been using DMU since uh, since its inception when it was started in uh, Ada. So, uh, I, I think I started using the since 2021, and till now, approximately, I would have done around 100 till now. 
and uh, haven't had even a single reaction. And actually, regarding what Sir was telling, uh, uh, one eyed patient, up till now I have three one eyed patients. After gaining experience over a year, then I found the molecule was good. So, uh, one, three of, uh, two of these patients, one eyed, advanced AMD, uh, used to recur on, uh, uh, on ILEA. Uh, and they had got almost uh, around 18 to 20 injections till now. Those patients are with me since five years. Shifted on one single dose of UV. I mean, I, I gave them loaded dose of UV. Immediately after that, first time ever the patient could have, sh I had stayed with the patient for three months, four months. And since the last year, patient is treatment free. So, and specifically talking about diabetic macular edema now, uh, I mostly prefer beauty because what I've seen is that all these newer generation molecules, like so we talk about this loading dose. Loading dose was talked at a time when after, when uh, Rastin was there, and even after the first dose of injection, it was not enough to clear the fluid. But once we start using beauty, you see that even 600 microns, they just vanish in a month's time. With such injections, I personally feel that many times we don't need, and many times just one injection finishes the whole fluid, and then I straight away start on PRM. So that has reduced the, the use of the injection per se in terms of the, the volume, and uh, it gives very fast results. So, especially DME works very, very well. PCV, yes, absolutely, no doubts about it. But even in DME, what I have seen is I don't need to complete a loading dose. One injection finished, fluid is dry, and then straight away go on to PRM. Thank you. I want to ask just for me, maybe for us, a governmental hospital, we don't have any bias for any indication because you know that we need the patient to be extended. Just go on. I don't know, the private, this is the real because it came to my ear that, that they, sometimes because of the private that the patient and the loading doses will be every six weeks, different than one month. So the income for the doctor it will be different. So this is it's good. Nah, nah, Did you hear those? Okay. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> that was a problem. This is even big challenge. No, no, no. Just I'm. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Just I'm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Just I'm. Other way around. So you can. It's actually a very wrong. I would have become a smart dog because of you. Yeah. Actually, if you ask, if you see the effectivity of the drug, we all know that the drug is extremely effective. And the safety in diabetic macular edema has been well established in comparison to AMD. Drying effect is excellent, longer lasting effect, less number of injections. This is what we need. Unmet needs, if you have persistent fluid, then you have to give more number of injections. So, Bayou is quite effective in those terms. And in real life and in clinical trial, if you compare, it's very different. You know, many a times patients actually skip loading doses also. You will not be able to give loading this so, is an ideal drug in that situation because you still have this good drying effect which lasts very long so you are not worried if you, even if you skip the dose the drying effect will still remain so i think more and more experience and then more and more yeah well, the, the, the feedback could be and yeah, so coming more experience with the drug will make you more confident to inject in diabetics even treatment naive patients i think should be good and this is the Okay. Yeah. So, okay, I, I have also given almost 50 injections of BUV. Sure. And uh, okay, what I realized in the private practice, as you're asking, that uh, if you give a first injection, patients give some improvement, they get a ray of hope, they stick to you. If you're giving an injection, who no, is not working with you, one more injection, no, it is very difficult for a patient to understand that you know he needs three or four injections once a day. In the BOB, immediately after two weeks, there is a dramatic improvement and it increases the confidence of the patient. And uh, I really use loading doses. After one injection, we have started driving for the PRM. And fortunately, there is no so far any trouble information. And I, I use a different strategy. I start my patients with DME with guide and crystal criteria. So I tell them that we'll give you five loading doses six weeks apart. And in one year, I've I had one patient who was supposed to see four injections. That's it. So once I see a flat macula, I discontinue that loading dose pattern. So I mean, on an average, three injections are good enough for a double diffuse DM. Practically, it uses the cystic means. And I mean, yeah. one, one more point which Dr. Mohan had raised was that we only came at a time when it was peak COVID. 
we were having a lot of patients coming just without anything with uh, vascular I've seen most galoid patients post vaccine coming with just vasculitis without anything. So it could be a, a oh, scenario, yeah. it could be a confounding factor which probably no one took into consideration at that time. And if actually we see the studies now, the post marketing data which is coming on daily, since then, like probably post 2021, the incidence of vasculitis has significantly gone down and probably very, very rare. Most of the incidences happened at that time, which I believe this was a very important confounding factor which no one took into consideration. That could be because of uh, if in general, even if so, here, the yes. I, I was not mentioning, like I mentioned here, one of the patients he was, he has the blood, he has uh, COVID and died already there because of the COVID. So even that, this is the mention this study before. I see Michelle, thank you for yeah. that. Yeah, I have been using the and what I found out in my experience that I am very comfortable in using diabetic methane that is established. I am no presumption of having any apprehensive ones in using the blood in the end. Yeah. In, in neovascular AMD, because of the age factor, sometimes it's very difficult to determine which patient is going to get the inflammation. However, most the rate of inflammation has much reduced now, and, and it's much less in that case. And it's around, now it is less than 3%. But whatever inflammation we thought of, there's a control. But vision, tibetan uh, inflammation, which is arteriolar occlusion, that is around 1%. So people are confident now. But in aging patient, is very difficult. There is something called anti drug antibody. So the level of that in the system is very difficult to determine. Okay? So, however, the lab investigations or the study will show that the patients who had a higher ADA level, those are the patients who get an inflammatory response, okay, which are type 4 hypersensitive. So it is, but in diabetes, yes, we are confident in using, and I'm very confident for forever in using. But now comes the point of lowly dose. You know, it's very difficult to tell the patients because the drug works so well. So what I do in diabetes, you can call it a PRM, but I take it, I customize this as an individual patient study. So once I keep the clear view, I call the patient a six week because six weeks I must keep the loading. I check and it's good. But I want my loading dose to be on the, I usually don't need more than two. But however, I go like this I get injections, I get check at six weeks, and six weeks dry. I call at two months, I need the second. Okay? And then I again call it second month, and it's dry. I extend it three months. And then I give the three months dose, then I give the other. And most of the time, I don't need it. And this is a good part of the DOD and DME. You know, it works wonderful. In AMD, you have to justify medicine based on the patient. But in little younger uh, AMD patients, in the age who are around uh, 50, 55, I'm comforted because in those patients, uh, uh, less chances of getting an inflammatory response so aggressive. And it works wonderful. Today, my patient can, after the fourth dose, his fibrovascular PD has flattened down. So I'm going to repeat it again after three months. And he's eager to do that because after so many years, he saw him flatten down before he had that reverse So I think you should individualize a patient. But remember, as the age goes up, I personally feel the chance of getting an inflammatory response. Even the gender, the gender, the gender, you both more to the gender, the female more more prone to have the uh, yeah. this Yeah, so you have to customize your own patients, but always study from your patients and apply. Okay, but follow the gender. Uh, thank you very much for all this uh, comment. Uh, just I will uh, have a small comment about, uh, about, let's say, to conclude about uh, the opinion. Uh, I was having a good experience in safety patients in the early beginning on AMD. And I have done many patients of AMD uh, in the beginning. And even I have done some of them, they are main medications. Okay? And unfortunately, I didn't find any uh, implantable process in the, all of the patients. And actually, most of them, 
most of them. Whenever they get the first injection, they come to you to tell you, please give me the, this medication or I have it. And I, I you know, because it's really, I mean, it was, for, even for me as a doctor, this is the first time when I faced uh, that you are giving an injection for one week, one week. The patient can go from counting either to or one three or one four, and he is an AMD. You know, this is uh, something magic for the patient, and they are very satisfied, and there is no problem. If you are the most important, you have to look for only only examining the patient, and uh, I mean, uh, uh, you can interfere in the uh, in the right time if there is any inflammation. Uh, this is an AMD. I didn't have the chance actually to do it in uh, diabetic macular edema. Till now, but I think I think I mean yeah, as doctor, I have one patient. He was over eighty with the AMD, and I gave him three injection. Okay, and it was uh, I mean yeah, unbelievable about uh, this is what I'm saying that you will be able to predict. Okay, now I'll tell you what is the most picture I did. I have patients with inflammation to tell you the truth. I have patients with oxygen. Yes, so. That is what I'm saying, but I still use it because that is how I customize my patients. I don't believe on who comes and takes me what. I believe on my patient. I always go back and see what works good, and that's how I get my own table formula. And yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you go and see why there is no inflammatory process in the patient of uh, diabetic mitral, you know, it's available, and maybe one of the factors you mentioned the age. But it could be something else. It came to my mind like this because it may be the load in those the other one they are giving every two weeks, while here they are giving every six weeks. Uh, is one uh, uh, of the reasons it could be. Um, uh, yes, the duration. Yeah, will see also, that most of the time it comes out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, like it will change. But at the same time, we cannot yeah, prevent our patient from the getting improvement yeah, because there is one percent that they will get this uh, complication. So it is at the end. It's uh, a time, a time of uh, a type of how which patient you are going to select. So already you have taken a lot of time in discussing this uh, topic. So thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. Thank you for all. So now we can move to the second part of our meeting, and I will hand over this uh, mic now to Dr. Alala. He will moderate the second part, and we will have panelists with our Dr. Sandeep and Dr. Abdul Aziz. And Dr. Omar. Um, will be the first. Uh, thank you, Dr. Omar, for uh, your invitation. Uh, I think we we'll start first with uh, Dr. Mandi. Thank you, Dr. Amri and Niam, for this opportunity. Good that uh, we have a lot of time for different kinds of discussions. So I brought up this topic basically. Uh, it's a simple, straightforward case presentation. I just want to know a few and different points of management of this particular patient. How would my colleagues uh, manage this particular case and stepwise approach? So, persistent uh, fluid optometry is nothing unusual. We see it day in and day out in our practice. This particular patient was a 61 year old Marathi uh, lady who came with bilateral vision loss, uh, type 2 DM. She has had cataract surgery done in both eyes, PRP done in both eyes. You are moving or I am moving it. <laughs> so the eye of interest is the right eye, which was 0.1. PCL, she had a partial PVD, ERM, typical vitroskytic picture with the uh, fracture retinal detachment having two or three different foci. This is how she presented to us. She quickly worsened. This was a one day pre operative. And uh, that's what I did for her. A routine PVD induction, and there were multi layer uh, split, in, which was nice as in split. So, did a bit of to me, removed the membranes. If you see around the superior and inferior arcades, that's where the real traction RDS mantle is more or less actually attached. There was fluid under the retina around these uh, focal detachments. So I, I was able to dissect the membranes without creating any retinal break. I went ahead and removed that retinal membrane along with that uh, 
the main trunk of the orthopedic disc. Eventually, it did uh, island peeling, a small island peeling around the, around the material area. With an FGE endo laser, very, very routine stuff, nothing, no alarms actually. So I will skip this part, I think. So, poll one, okay. Uh, I need your opinions. How many of us would like to actually do a drainage right not me or extended eye peel in this particular patient? Eye yes. Extended eye peeling. Eye peeling, of course, but you want to extend it to the arcades wherever that disturbed area was or? None of them. None of them. Yeah. Yeah, but not extended, right? Extended. No, after the arcade, you will not do? No, I didn't do it, but it's open house, you know. So you might like to do things a little differently. So by extended ILM peeling, he means beyond the arcade. Right? Yeah, beyond the arcade. Beyond the arcade. No, and we not do drainage right now. Yeah, So, poll two, what would you like to use as a tamponade in this particular patient? Air. Air. Air maximum assistance. Okay. So I think all of us are on the same page. Air. Uh, this is how this patient uh, fared at the end of one week. She had a uh, significant amount of subretinal fluid which actually pulled up onto the macular area. That's how she was one month later. The fluid hardly moved. It neither increased nor decreased. This is how she was three months later. If I can show you the, the topography of the macula, this is how it looked. Practically did not move at all. So what would be the next next course of management? There, there is no retinal break, nothing. Uh, I've screened the patient, retina is seen. Yeah. This was a traction, right? There was no break. This is, this is subretinal fluid. This is subretinal fluid. Shifting, shifting from up. So for me, shifting coming, coming from up, I will observe. With the arrow. Yeah, yeah, I, I, have exactly, huh? I have exactly, I have exactly the same case. I will observe one more. From this picture, post -service. No, I don't. That's I, all I have. I have exactly the same picture, and uh, yeah. I reoperated, uh, and I did the posterior retinotomy. It is very thick in trapped fluid. Exactly. So it's going nowhere, and it's going to detach the attached macula. So that's that's my next question for Dr. the. So I, I mean, if you go, if you go there and uh, you, you try to find membranes, you won't be able to find any because you did uh, uh, peeling, wood peeling. You did uh, ILM peeling to start with. So this some sometimes uh, you get this entrapped fluid under and it's going to go very thick. It's not going to move. So I try. I put uh, dual blue and I try to see anything. There is one, nothing. So by the end, I even injected. PFCL in order to stabilize the posterior retina, trying to squeeze fluid to any unseen breaks. You won't, you won't find any. So by the end, I resorted to the old good method. It's not very good. This uh, posterior retinotomy, temporal, severe, small, and uh, remove PFCL and uh, fluid air exchange with the range of this. What's that kind of fluid you have you found? That? It's very thick fluid to. It's very say, proteinaceous and, and it's not going to absorb. And the problem, the problem with time, this is encroaching upon the macula, and this one is just threatening the macula. It's going to be. So what will be your timing of surgery? How long would you wait? What, what would you choose out of this? This, this is uh, almost. Uh, it's not three months. Not three months. Involving the phobia, right? Yeah. Yes. You have to operate immediately. Well, I will not do the surgery. Yeah. When is it as this? What does the discuss? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Open for, for, for me. I will, I will speak about this case. Yeah. I will speak about this case. 
ultimately when they moved by the back they was attacked before they was attached and they didn't create a new rate. So what happened when you make air flow this is my, my explanation when you make air flow exchange gravity came and all the fluid that are came, came to the vestibular pool. Yeah. So for me any this is need the RBE to be built. I will go to make the healthy blood pressure diabetes if sometimes maybe I'll give him uh, diamonds if the pressure is good to the eye. I try my best from him and to him. But I will not do the surgery for him unless there is a bit of it there. Because this is, it will be absorbed, maybe within months, then I can give injection, but I will do the surgery, I will not do the surgery. Sometime after the problem uh, immediately or after or surgery, if you do OCT, uh, the maculus flat, there is no evidence of fluid. There is no evidence of fluid whatsoever. Then after uh, two, uh, two months, the patient uh, didn't follow up and he just came with can you see the picture? Maybe? I don't have the picture. The OCT picture uh, here. Yes, it's uh, bisecting the fovea here. It's almost very close to the. Uh, it's almost. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have to go, you have so to go for the surgery. The is around 0.1 at this point. This fluid cannot be like. Yes. You make a to me what? This is an outpatient gas exchange, which is not a side. See, I, I, I think the and first the time the patient, it, this could be a combined. So there could be a micro break. See, when, when you looked into the, like, those little like, biometroscopy, you feel it is absolutely attached. Attached. Absolutely attached. There's nothing, no membrane, no break. But they do OCT, you see this. Because I, that kind of, I have a case like this, and the patient yeah. totally absorbed, totally absorbed by within one, one month. So uh, I, my friend, I have one friend, another friend, he shared cases. They said he go and put oil. No, no, oil is bad choice. He put oil, he put, because they have it, but repeating the surgery, so put oil. For us, I feel that this is, you can't try any conservative before doing the surgery, at least give the time for the patient. Because if you have this fluid post little buckling, you have such kind of picture post little buckling, where you do a non-drainage, fluid is not connecting to any little break, maybe a month or two, you can still wait. As if the fluid is going down. So, but in this situation, you definitely. Doctor, it was, it was this is according to my knowledge. I don't know. It was this is. So, so if you have, if you decide to go for surgery, what timing? Would you do it at uh, three months? Like the doctor will go in, doctor Thakur will go in, the person will wait. I think I will for, wait. for me the threshold would be six weeks. Six, six weeks to two months maximum, and depending on the patient's comfort. For me, after six yeah, that's months. important. Yeah, six months actually we can observe the CT, the CT and we can check the volume of the fluid. If there is a decrement in the fluid volume, we can observe. Yeah. But if there is a, you know, the fluid is not going, volume is not going less, then after two to six months we can then. So, so Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nazim, what, what do you think? What, uh, Dr. Nazim, so you have a... Uh, patient Nazim, Nazim, Nazim. Patient, they want you to present improvement. Even if the fluid is absorbed after six months, there won't be any vision, there will be chronic changes. I will, I will wait for at least uh, two or three months and keep on doing the OCTs to see if the fluid is increasing. One. And two, if I ever have to go inside, I must be sure that all the retinal all around is good. I will stay in it. Yeah? One. The two, I might use a 41 gauge and use an active section so I don't have to laser extensively if you make a retinal. So, 41 gauge is good. You do active suction and suck the fluid up. So, active suction will anyway be required because this fluid is very thick and coating high. And that is why it doesn't. So, nothing if you do a do fluid fluid exchange, uh -huh. not typical fluid fluid exchange, then do fluid exchange. Yeah, first we'll do a fluid fluid exchange. Then we go 41. Yeah. 41 gauge is the beginning of it. Okay. okay. We don't do retinal, it's a puncture therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, my patient but that was already after was already in months uh, after, after so. so if you see, uh, you know, certain uh, articles which uh, cumulatively uh, present this kind of data that this kind of PSF uh, reduces it so recovers spontaneously in hundred percent of the almost like hundred percent of the patients in one to two months, and some patients, uh, some of the articles say that around five percent of the patients, this kind of fluid can still persist. Till 12 months. So I wanted to wait for some more time. So this is a post op at six months. 
This is at nine months. Fluid is still not going anywhere, but you see the superior part of it. It has now started regressing. And now it goes 12 months. At 12 months, you see a little bit, maybe phobia is getting attached, her vision is improved to 0.2, but still, and at this point of time, patient is really getting apprehensive, but when I tell her to go for the surgery, she is she's a very old lady, she doesn't want surgery. At the same time, she's unhappy with me that vision is not improving. So 12 months now, that's how six, nine, and 12 months OCT look like. Minimal changes, but still frozen fluid, absolutely. So now what do you do? After one year? After one year. <laughs> All right. So at this point of time she was unhappy, but she was not agreeing for any any surgical intervention. So I tried something something different, which I read in a couple of articles. I thought let's try the most non-lethal way and go ahead and do a laser photocoagulation and RP stimulation. So there are certain reports in, in the literature on uh, a laser force stimulation working in this kind of cases of uh, not PSFs. Uh, PSF is have been shown strong correlation with uh, choroidal hyperpermeability, and that has been proven along with uh, ICG and FFA findings as well. There are certain uh, treatments uh, recommended like use of epilenol, just on the lines of CSR, which have shown that uh, they do work in such cases as well, if you want to go conservative. So what I did is actually uh, at one year post-op, I did a grid photocoagulation for her. Don't ask me why, it was just an RP stimulation. I did not have micropulse laser at that point of time. So this is how three months after the, uh, sorry, four weeks after the laser, the patient started resolving. This is six weeks post laser, it's immediate effect. Eight weeks, she was absolutely flat and she was 0 0.7. And 29 months, that is almost two and a half years later, she's maintaining that full integrity with 0 0.7 vision. So a fluke, which, which worked, uh, I can call it a fluke. So if you look into the uh, PSF and uh, causes, it's actually the chronic nature of the fluid that we have been discussing and amount of pre-operative macular elevation before the surgery has got a strong correlation with amount of PSF you can have post-operatively and the duration. To assume causes of PSF are extensive intraocular laser, intraoperative laser, confluence of laser along the arcades, presence of micro breaks, which are ruled out here, choroidal hyperpermeability, associated myopia, persistent traction, we have discussed that, combined mechanism, Dr. Thakur was saying the same, and uh, overall dysfunction of the RPE. And that's where the, the hypothesis of RP stimulation actually comes into picture. So the effect of PSF, of course, we know it can create photoreceptor damage and uh, permanent vision loss as well. To conclude, uh, acrylchloride is one condition that should be ruled out. And uh, laser photocoagulation, multipulse, PDT, epidural, all have been shown to work. Before you move into a surgical intervention, you can try these. To conclude, uh, in such a case, there is no role of well, long term temporary, no role of extended island peeling, there is no role of uh, braided retinotomy initially. And in case of persistent cervical fluid, uh, now this is important, we'll come back to it later. Yeah does not impact the final physiological outcome at one year. Now, when you talk about persistent uh, submacular fluid, there's a difference defined between red RD and traction RD. When we talk about thick fluid, it is supposed to have those proteinaceous uh, pro-RP factors, which does not allow that RP disintegration to happen. So despite of, if you leave this fluid over a period of one year, you do get good results in terms of visual acuity. However, this fluid, if it is from break RDs, they are not so forgiving. So had it been a red metal detachment, I would have gone in and intervened probably at six weeks, two months or something like that. But because this was purely a traction RD, I, I just waited for quite some time. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Mandy, for a nice case. So uh, my understanding, you did uh, the laser, the PRP, and they attached it to it. I, I just did a 
like classical grid photoviolation which we used to do for diffuse DME initially. Away, like, away from no, the, on the detached portion. On the detached portion. On the detached portion, that stuff will be. So what, what's the end point? Did you get like any job point? I don't get uh, a faint. Because there's a faint flow. Uh, it was yeah. transparent, doctor. So I don't get uh, not exactly what the kind of reaction that we used to do in classical uh, grade photovibration, but you could see the laser, faint laser mass. But that was the objective actually. It was not to go in and charge that part of the retina. Just to stimulate it. Just simulate the same mechanism as we used to do in grid uh, yes. grid uh, yeah. for macular disease. So yeah, if you have multiples, you could actually do a micro pulse laser also. Thank you, Dr. Mandiba. I think uh, for the sake of time, we would uh, move to uh, the next case, Dr. Hassan. Yeah, just uh, we'll share one case. We need your advice. This man is came for our emergency that he has high myopia. High myopia. The patient has uh, 30, 37, 37 millimeter black cell leg, and he has bullous uh, RV. You can see here bullous RV, and the patient has uh, a horse rotator 12 to 12. So I decided for him, the patient is the easy thing: go for neurotypical at the beginning, run away from this case. So. I injected gas, you can see the, the, the book of the vision, but the vision has the, after we, the, the resolving of the fluid, the patient within, within two days, there's a dual fluid, but the fluid didn't improve. We discharge the patient, they tell us again, there is, we do the laser for the, the break up and discharge him. And we thought that this it could be hypotonic, because the patient have hypotonic, high myopia. So maybe there's this one of the fluid. We examine again, there's no tears at all. The problem is that the inferior RD came back and the patient had to turn and the superior retina, the brake is attached. The sector where is the brake is attached. So now we can, where is the brake, the air brake, we indent the vision, then we decide for the vision, and decide for the vision to go for the vitrectomy. And during the vitrectomy, the brake was here. This is the reverse upside down. This is the, the, the machine. Can see the fluid here, the clear fluid come from the optic nerve, very popular uh, very area, parapapillary area, and the staphyloma in the tear is there. So, what you advise me? What should support for the patient? But now the break is here. What you advise me to do for the patient? How can I repair? Well, where is it? Is it between the. Yeah, the break here, the, 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 on the staphyloma, on the optic nerve, para, very, very popular area, in the staphyloma, the, not in the retina, there is no RB. The retina when they come back from come out from the the vessels come out from from the optic nerve between two major vessels. Yeah, you know what to do next. <laughs> so here you can see it's here. I will, you'll see it now in the the video. So what you advise me what to do for the patient? Because I have another case experience this. So the the area. Yeah, yeah, in the very primary area. Yeah, very this is the, 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 the patient has 37 millimeters. No, no, no. Uh, is it, uh, the slit, slit like here between two, two major vessels. Slit like. The, 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 the fluid came from here. The, the, this is the back flush. Fluid coming from here. What's supposed to the patient? The baby, the baby, the baby. Hassan, this, this, this photo is not clear. <laughs> <laughs> we can't the, the, the tear is here. <laughs> And this is the yeah. kind of court you are trying to uh, well, uh, PVD, I will, I will use PVD. Just, uh, go for the second slide. Now we'll go back. The VB
Remove the vitreous. Here, the, 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 the tear was here, this area. Now I discovered that where is the tear? Who was RD? From where? But I know that the benefit I did, I hear the sector where the retina was attached. So when I enter, I said there is surely one tear. But when I examine this, you can see now the clear fluid come from this area. So I know that the problem is here now. And there is traction in this area, which makes this as a, as uh, keep the fluid uh, worse. So I just you will see the video go on now because I shared this video with you already. So I already did it. So you can see the fluid came from the, uh, the subretinal fluid in the nearest of the vitreous to that, that area. Um, so here I just I want to see where in, in, in this area, this is the film here, in this area, you can see it's here. Between two pages, it's look like, then I take the uh, can see it's here. It's almost, it's almost like uh, coloboma, coloboma cases, coloboma cases on the edge. Yeah, here, here, after I remove the, the vitreous. This is ILM or this is... The yeah, we see it now. This, this, is, this is a clear tear because this is, I did a patient for him with the fluid, then I did the FCL, now we just I clean the vitreous. Then I, I, I uh, mark the area because I can't see it to be clear. When I go to the, the back, when I try it, you can't see it. So I mark it. You can't put a good to leave CL. You can't see the stapiloma. Is everything is here. The tear, the tear is here in the stapiloma area. So I have another case. Why I share this? Because I have another case. I finish it. The patient has back with the retinal attachment. So I need to do it for the uh, here you can see I removed the and then I used the ILM to I, I suspected this could be even optic disc bit. So I put the batch here, then I removed the but you know that putting the batch under without BFCL is nothing. You need the BFCL to be and stop one. Now do you need the uh, just uh, make it, can you just uh, ask them the video? Just go to the hub or more. And talk to them. Put the. Uh, this video or not? This one or two? Yeah, more, more, more. So, what I did here, I use even the BFCL to. Fix the retina of the wound, then I would dial and. Schlieren sign is clear now. The Schlieren sign. What do you use as time for it yet, sir? Gas. Yeah, gas. Yes. I put the ILM after I uh, used the VCL, then I took the ILM uh, batch. Here, what you would do? Do you put the ILM? Cover the tear, or you will wait a little bit, or what you will do, retinotomy. Somebody is use a retinal uh, graft, somebody will use just as I use here the ILM, somebody is use even the blue. So here I decide to put, because I know there is no RBE in this area. So my plan was to put something, tuck it inside the, the staphyloma to prevent any fluid to go back, and that will depend on the RBE on the other side, on all the retina. To keep the retina attached, at least avoid any any interest from this. Because I have another case, the same high myopia. The patient after I did, I didn't do it for that. Then the patient has the retinal attachment. So, yeah, Hassan, if you do you think if you do only eye cleaning and do fluid exchange and do the gas, this 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 for me, I have another case. It's failed. Even I can't share it. Maybe yeah. So sometimes we find this one in. Uh, 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 and even if, if we do iron peeling and extend it to the uh, edge of the staphyloma and look for the exchange and use gas and uh, it, could, it could be, but for me I want to close the defect. Yeah. Because here is that the staphyloma here is not normal to be uh, as generally the posterior pool yeah. of the retina will not be um, regular, to be irregular, to be as in uh, two walls connected together. If you see that here the staphyloma, and here is the tear. So for it's me, a, I feel that this this area is different than this area. So I want to put something here to to tuck it. You can see this is the tear. 
So I took one batch. Then I I use uh, the BFC at least to to to, to more, more manipulate the ILM. I put one batch here too, because I suspected it could be here the optic disk bit. So I put one a small batch. Then I make here yeah, uh, saving uh, the formula. I make uh, uh, then I remove the, the batch and I tuck it inside the, the tin. Yeah, so as same as if you deal with with macro but, uh, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. this is in the in the optic. General macular yeah. I don't tuck it. General, yeah. I want to cover it on the surface no. because they say even the, the I see, yeah. you can see it. I tuck it because in the end you see the whole thing. So I finish here. I make the return to make air fluid exchange because I want to remove the EFCN and I want to be able to avoid any fluid to come to the batch. You can see the last. So this is the, maybe the, the last slide. Then I do the laser for the laser for me. Then I put gas for the patients. Uh, so uh, when you, uh, when you injected it, here the retina, just let me, and here the, the phobia, and you can see here is the, the, here the batch which I did. This is this is here. Here's the, here the tear, and here's the ILM uh, And the vision to prove even for zero volt. Very nice. But my question when you injected the BMC here, yeah. uh, 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 the fluid is still there. And, uh, and the periphery. Ah, uh, it's still there. The periphery. That's why you was, uh, even uh, I, uh, the previous patient, I used the subretinal uh, red blue to see if there is any leakage. So for me, it was from the beginning. I searched the periphery. Nothing there. The fluid was stuck in the periphery. I know that the problem was with the optic. Nice job. So what's your choice for this patient? You would use the iron water or rugas graft. To use the retinal water or rugas graft. Amniotic membrane, posterior capsule graft, biologic glue. We had 60 or 270 parallel binary laser. What's your choices? I was here in these cases. It could be here. Because there is a report about using the laser around the skin to prevent it. Uh, if, is it a bit, uh, yeah. so if the diagnosis is, is optic disc we can you, you can use uh, the, the laser as a barrage. Uh, but even in the optic disc field, you know, and there is some light CSR uh, disease, even if you do vitrectomy and uh, BVD, use BVD and do the ILM feeling, and the, uh, the, the fluid will be absorbed. Uh, well, I said, but this one is, 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 is different. Yeah, for me, maybe I would think to do that, but I will not do this uh, autologous graph. Or, you know, or I, I, will, I will deal with IM. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Use, because uh, even Dr. Yeah. Uh, Shinwood, she, uh, she used the biological group. She would yes. even though yeah. 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 so you can use the time to tell you that there is a nice paper. Uh, what you did is uh, wonderful because you know you cannot raise attention. So tucking in is a good idea because it's a slit hole. No? If you tuck in, then the edges will come together. Try to fill the yeah. gap. Yeah. Exactly. One, two. That biologic glue. That recently there is there was a presentation last year in, uh, in American society. So the, it was wonderful of not doing just doing a refractory. And drain it and put that tissue glue or the biology glue over there, and then you will see that to disintegrate over time, and we don't need to laser it. So, biology glue may be an option there, okay? But easiest is what you did, you know. Of course, which is the, because the, why is it for some? Maybe as Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Aziz mentioned, the uh, important note that he said that you can do cleaning the island without tucking to be to do it to do the work for me. The previous one didn't do the work. It was the same. I cleaned everything, and I said I, would, I was I was encouraged enough to put the gas for the patient. Fast finish. The patient came back with a three retinal detachment. Then we go inside. We put under the. We inject through the stair. We inject the membrane blue, and we reach the periphery. Nothing there. So we know that the problem here. So why is it that this second that I will not make the mistake? So yeah, I, I think this is a variant of uh, retinal detachment associated with coloboma. Because uh, with coloboma, we can see these slit, uh, slit holes on the edge of the coloboma. It's a localized coloboma. Uh, with the optic nerve bit, we, uh, we have uh, maculopathy. So we do not get retinal detachment um, mostly. So these are exactly what we used to see. But this is a nice case because it's a localized coloboma. And you have to duck. You 
cannot just uh, put a flag of ILM. I, I think you have to tuck it. To remove some you have things. you have it to tuck it inside. You can tuck also. If but, sometimes but, it's I very mean, difficult to create an ILM in uh, very high myopic patients. In this uh, this patient, amniotic membrane graft as we did for would be any chronic macular. Because it's, uh, it's really Can hard to, to I use uh, the normal. Uh, no, no, here. Uh, 37 I use, I use uh, the text. Which I don't think for some you use. Here you can see that I don't use the ILM here. I use the in the gripping myopic uh, course. This is 38, 30, yeah, yeah, or 40. This is a nice. Uh, yeah, this, uh, uh, even though we do it, we open the not that easy. I don't know which there. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for a very nice case stimulated discussion. And uh, we move uh, to the next uh, surgical case presentation. Dr. Mohid. Dr. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, the organization. Thanks, Dr. Mohammed uh, giving me this opportunity and special thanks to Mandeep. He almost covered all the topics. So I'm also going to discuss about a similar uh, case. Uh, so my case is also a uh, persistent uh, submacular oh, fluke oh, after diabetic today. So actually uh, So uh, I had a 65 year old gentleman uh, who had diabetes for the last 15 years with coexisting hypertension but no nephropathy. And uh, I operated the left eye six months back for a combined uh, detachment. There was a hole in the nasal periphery. Um, uh, so surgery so went well. We did we remove all the membranes in the first sitting. That was well a test. But even after six months, there were some fluid pockets at the macula. So we can see the extent of the fluid. Pointer, uh, um, pointer. Yeah, so we can uh, uh, observe here the extent of Uh, extent of the fluid. So, fluid was localized, well confined, and periphery of the retina is well attested, and it's been six months. If we compare between the level of fluids, uh, the three months, fluid after three months and the six months is almost same, the volume is almost same, it is not resolving. So, uh, what should we do? Observation or any intervention? Uh, since there was no uh, resolution of the subretinal fluid, so I thought for the intervention. So, what may be the options? So, I had no clues about doing the, you know, the laser or this type of fluid, and I had no experience. So, that was out of question at that time. So, what options we had? Um, actually, the primary surgery I have done uh, island peeling. It was quite extended from arcade to arcade. Matter of fact, I extended the island peeling beyond the lower inferior arcade. Uh, so there is nothing that we can remove except there is a small area um, where we can see that the artery and the vein are very close and maybe there is some contracture here and uh, matter of fact there was some island feeling, uh, island island is also there. So I thought better I go inside, I will remove this membrane and uh, try to figure out what else we can do. So the thought that I had that this is a chronic, you know, uh, traction level attachment, there is an intraatinal shortening. So if I drain the fluid, even draining the fluid will not help to settle the retina. So what if I make a multiple retinoid means that helps in relaxation of the retina itself. So the ones the SRF will start resolving, these retinoid means extend and use become like elliptical and it takes a contour and helps in the retina. Uh, reattachment. Come and the surgery. Yep. So, so uh, we did the silicone removal. 
uh, we observed that very free, there was no traction. We still, you can see that there is a, such a good island feeding was done, even this going below the arcades. So there was an island of the island that I removed, and uh, I was able to remove the small membrane over the arcade here as well. There was not much tissue. I tried to grab the any membrane at the multiple areas, but there was nothing. There was slight fibrous tissue over the blood vessels. I tried to remove and I was successful to uh, release this uh, fibrous tissue also. But I can also recognize very taut, stiff. So I just release, I know that this is not causing so obvious contraction. I, I accelerate the island feeding beyond that also, but I was not able to get a, a flap. It is why it comes in a little bit. So whatever is possible, I extend in a temporal periphery as well as the inferior periphery. So what is the theory if you are extending the island feeding? Why you would in the first surgery? No. Is the first or the second? It's the second surgery. Yeah. No. yeah. Uh, actually, just because I want to remove all the items over the, the area which is taut and where the blue is. Still, there was contracture of the. Still, there are It's like, you know, the umbrella is like a top. So, I did the retinotomies in this fashion. This retinotomy is exactly where the epicenter was. One retinotomy I made inside the kit. Idea is not just to drain the fluid, just to give some space for the retina to get relaxed uh, and settle down. So, the total four retinotomies I made. Very tiny. What is that again? It is 25 days, sir. 25. 25. So, uh, after removing all the SRF, um, I find difficulty in doing the laser. Uh, I'll just show it here. So the laser reaction was not coming great. So I did multiple times, you know, fluid suction. But I still realized that intraoperative with the retina is very stiff. Even with the full suction, it was not coming at so position. And the laser reaction is also not coming so well. So next day, the first post-op day, there was a fluid. After almost a similar amount, it was clear. But it starts resolving. At 10 days, there is a much reduction in the fluid. And at 4 weeks, the fovea was a test. There was slight fluid in the inferior arcade. And, but it takes around 10 weeks for almost complete dissolution of the fluid. But there was slight fluid uh, under the fovea that uh, dissolved further. So, what is this? Uh, yeah, I came for the silicon oil. The reason was uh, uh, after the laser, I was not confident that uh, there was such a good uh, laser reaction. And I may need to supplement laser in the post op. So, and it was such a taut retina. I had a you know, real uh, confusion to put the gas or the continue with the oil. But uh, anyhow, I favored in the oil and put the oil here. I think uh, I think the third absorbed it because of the uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, of course, of course. And I think uh, the uh, as, uh, as Dr. Nazim said earlier, with a four, uh, 40 gauge uh, cannula with very active suction, you can get all the fluid because I don't think the fluid was drained through the yeah. retinotomy to start yeah. with. Before you removed it, I could see in the macula a lot of diabetic changes. Okay? Did you intend to do the fluorescent angiography first uh, before doing the silicone? I did not do any angiography. But how, how this could be related to the subretinal flow? The subretinal flow, you do not know whether it is a, whether the diabetic myopathy itself is also contributing. Yes, okay. One. So that then you might also think you Mandeep's screen may work on that. One yes, is a good point. Okay. And, and, and number two, it is not showing traction on your OCT. So there is Nothing called uh, it is cooling like this and become like a tabletop. 
because many times in chronic case like Monday, it may be possible. You have a lot of scars here, and the center right now, if there is fluid, it doesn't settle because there is a pool. And many times in recurrent artists, when we operate, which operate a month back, somebody operated five times. Okay, when it came to me, the whole macula, the posterior pole, is not settled. It is like this. Yes. I had to relax near the scars, then it settled. Okay, that thing can happen in Monday's case where there is extensive scar of the laser. But in your case, I would have done an angiography and tried to see okay, that area. And this is very difficult to, to tell, but here, you know what, a thicker gauge will take out the protein weight. So, uh, yeah. If, I, exactly. if, you ask, if you ask me from my, I don't know, I mean, really, I'm sorry to speak with Dr. Uh, Abdulaziz here, he's our mentor. He has the experience. If you ask me, I will not open retina to remove some retinal fluid, chronic one. Because all of my trials, always I regret. I regret because I don't reach my level which I wanted. I said that I will remove it. Then I inject fluid under the retina. I make all the retina bullets. Then I don't take it. If it was years there, you can't. I, my, from my practice. You have to use silicone oil. Because yeah, other than this, the same. Because yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. disease test. Yeah. So I said I prepare myself to put the put here for the patient. We don't do as Hassan said because we we, uh, we can't wait. So if I if okay. I'm going to drain, uh, what I do is to inject a, a bubble of BMCN over the optic disc. So it pushes the fluid to the periphery and it causes a dome because it's entrapped, it's going nowhere. And at the apex of the dome, I just do the retinal then you can see the fluid coming all the way up. So, so the in this case, PRP is the gel. This is gel for me. Yeah, in this case, you have put the oil in it. But uh, here, the retinoid didn't. Uh, so, now the question is that oil, which I hate, because oil causes a lot of uh, post injection inflammatory response. That is why many times you see in RCs when you do, you get see. So better to put gas because the silicon yes, stimulates the you know proliferation. In your case, since oil is there, you're going to remove it. The question is either you fill the island with a bubble of gas and throw it so the fluid is pushed down, like you do in case of you know, large screen. Even sometimes, Dr. In our, in our practice, we can, Dr. Moreto, she did it. In our practice, sometimes the patient. You can't forgive you. Yeah. He needs vision. If you repeat for him the record the attachment, so you said at least the oil gave you the the short window, or then you can know that it's at the attached retina, or because the attached retina he will not accept it from you. Or attached because when you put the oil, the patient has vision in second. Sometimes we do this. We practice. We practice this. The patient was in six months. He's not having a good vision, and putting the gas and not good vision is a real challenge. And retinotis also I was very concerned. I thought I need a laser again to the retinotis. And the matter of fact, it was not settled. And I tried to remove all the fluid, like multiple times I did the removal of the fluid by the active suction. So fluid was removed, but retina was not settling because it was so taut. So, so yeah, so uh, sometimes what you do is 25 gauge when the when the tip is there, the silicon tip, it's difficult sometimes. It's, uh, good, it is good for us. I take it out. Yes. Okay, then you agree because of blood, blood tip, not the green. Yeah. For See, at the end of the day, the surgical principle is that whatever is good in your hands, okay? But there is some basic principle. Whatever holds good, if you feel oil gives you good and it's your experience, go ahead. But follow and try to understand is the oil causing an inflammatory response or is it that diabetic changes is causing it? But many times when you don't touch it, it is also good. And that is what over the years that we have learned that we don't touch many times, we just keep it. And diabetic fluids are less harmful than the rag RD. Okay? Because rag RD fluids moves around, comes out of that, goes to the vitreous, whatever sub your uh, your biochemical properties are there, there's a loss. But in diabetes, it is trapped. So, so those biochemical component is still there. So the amount of photoreceptor damage of the RP will be less than in case of Raga. Six, three months and six months, there was no change in the fluid. Yeah, that's so different. Because the oil way. is there, so you have the excuse to go out in and take out the oil. Yes, uh, yeah. After some time, you have to go in. Uh, yeah, I mean, you are not, not going. Fluid before, so you 
cooperative also there was yes, yes, of, yes of course but again you have a, a sick rpe in diabetics anyway so, 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 so the is the same is stimulating is the zamantip case that the vision is the and even he but again, Dr. Nazim said that you have to. Uh, what what if we do uh, fluorescein? You have ischemic maculopathy. You have the ex. No, but I don't think this case is related to diabetes. Yes, because it was not so. It's a very thick. Uh, uh, very also thick. not there. So uh, how the angiography? I'll, I'll deal. I have not even uh, any idea. Like what the uh, angiography will make a difference in the management? What so, the features we have to look for in the angiography? So actually, if we go for the come later on. So if we go for the literature, we realize that um, the study shows that uh, this persons of vital fluid takes uh, almost, uh, some study shows that is an average, on an average it takes around four months to eight months for the complete resolution of the uh, persistence of retinal fluid. So not, uh, and even they find that around at the end of one year, around 10% of the patient, the fluid doesn't resolve. Uh, in another study, it was around one third patient, the food is not resolved even after one year. So then they have to go for the intervention. So uh, it is not like a clear idea like where we should go and what we should, if we go inside the eye, what should be done? Like alum is already been removed. So what else, like uh, is the laser can be done? Any other idea that we can go ahead for? Uh, yeah, actually, observation so, and no intervention. Yeah, what you did is yes, if you do. Uh, this return to me, I do feel the exchange, it, it, uh, it will be enough if you do the, the, the eye impeding. Because the theory of doing eye impeding is to the scaffold for the, the current PPR. And, and also, if you will take some uh, medication for the diabetic, it will be, it will be, it will be uh, faster. And, this one. and also, removing uh, the uh, uh, it will be easy. But eye uh, uh, impeding is not a treatment. Only to be sure that there is nothing uh, in the fracture of the retina or So, in that sense, like island, which is there, uh, very strong hypothesis, which is there in the literature as well, that you know, once the island is over there, it torts the retina, like it is, it, uh, it prevents the relaxation of the retina. Once we remove the island, it makes the retina more elastic to settle down. So, that was the concept. It's a controversial. Uh, controversial. Controversial. Yeah, controversial. Yeah, so, controversial. Yeah, so many discussions in all conferences. Uh, to be or not to be, <laughs> we can go till the till the morning. <laughs> the <beat. laughs> now he presented the Hassan presented that the ninety five percent results. Okay, if you leave it like that in six months, yes. So uh, what did you say? So each one case, you, know, you need to study those cases. What was their case? Or is the, like what is Hassan's case? And what is his case? You know, you just so but the basic principle of what you understood, like how to approach, that one thing is correct that we must give observation of that. Okay. And then so so what, 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 what also like to ask you, like I've never I have done in few cases the relaxing that not means. So do you think that is re relaxing that not means like making a hole that allows the retina to relax is having any any significant import without through the exchange? No, uh, like you made a retinotomy with the through the exchange, yeah. but rather than making a single retinotomy, multiple retinotomy is one exactly at the epicenter that gives some space for retina to relax and settle down and taking the but, uh, I, don't I, think, I don't think interaction retina detachment we do central relaxing retina. I think is it, is it mostly easy? relaxing retinas are peripheral and rigmatogenous. And, the, and the, it's not uh, not for a whole relaxing is not it's a, it, yes it's not being born it has it has a criteria to it, be it, it is the what you did is mostly like we, like we used to do before when we were here before yes we used to do penetration for subtractive bit for optic bit okay it didn't work much and then okay. yeah. so you, you you did something like that you may diagnose the inner Okay. And also, a retinal shortening has a criteria, or a retinal shortening, you, you have to, there's no signs of retinal shortening in this case. Relax means it was relaxing. 
Thank you very much uh, for this uh, excellent session, as usual. Uh, so at the end, we would like to thank all the speakers, panelists, and attendees for this uh, really uh, very nice uh, meeting and gathering. And if you don't mind, we need to take only one photo here. So for a reminder that we can have our uh, dinner. Uh, okay. so, uh, to conclude, the uh, view is a good uh, medicine for DME, and laser is good for persistent, persistent flow. We this is the conclusion. You for persistent microfluidia. Yeah, but if it's microparsia, it's, 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 it's uh, it could be a good idea. It's, it's microparsia. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, can we take it? Yeah, can this here, yeah. one side and the other side. Yeah. 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 Yeah, <laughs> 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 So the break or the dinner in the Thank you.